it feels really important that you bring whatever pressure you can to get that organization to declare a climate and ecological emergency. It's very solutions focused. Somebody once called it hope with its sleeves rolled up. Transition, um, there is a place for everybody in transition movement. And what I love is that usually the people who tell me that the stuff that I do is naive are people who believe that endless economic growth yeah, yeah. is possible <laughs> on, a finite, on a finite planet. That's only going to happen if, it f if that journey down feels like a move towards something utterly irresistible and mm. delicious and mm. irreplaceable and historic. We have a massive imagination deficiency, so we need to intentionally take the supplements to try and boost our imagination levels back up again. Hello everyone and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers, practitioners and activists to better understand the metabolism of our cities or in other words their resource use and pollution emissions and how to reduce them in a systemic, socially just and context specific way. I'm your host Aristide from Metabolism of Cities and on today's episode I will ask you to use your untapped superpower a superpower that could help us against current ecological and societal crises, a superpower that could increase our well-being by being more rooted and involved in our communities, a superpower that could shape future decarbonized, healthy and just societies. This superpower is imagination. And so in this episode, I would ask to use your imagination to envision a world where all cities, towns and villages have joined and applied principles from the transition movement. What would our lives and the environment look like in this future? To think about these questions, I'll discuss with none other than co-founder of the Transition Network and co-founder of Transition Town Totnes. He is a teacher of permaculture, an artist, a researcher, a podcaster, a brewery co-owner, and author of, of many books, including the Transition Handbook that has seen better days, and uh, From What Is to What If, Unleashing the Power of Imagination to Create the Future We Want. Mm. I'm talking, of course, of Rob Hopkins. But wait, there's more. Today I have not one, but two guests. On the side of Rob is Noemi Cheval. She is a member and co-founder of the Swiss Transition Hub, or Réseau Transition Suisse Romande, which supports many wonderful initiatives that we're going to discuss about today. She also traveled quite a lot from place to place to discover and transition personally, but also transition the territories. She's a trainer passionate about helping people and organization in their quest of transitioning. So I think these two perspectives will help us to understand how the, the transition movement was was birthed and also how it was implemented in different contexts. Just before kicking off, I'd like to thank Muriel Remy that uh, that helped me organize this episode and also the Université de Genève for providing us this, this room. I would also make a small request to all of you listening. The Swiss Transition Hub is currently having an active crowdfunding campaign. So please help them achieve their objectives on training and supporting transition actions in Switzerland. If you can help them, I think it will make a big difference over here. With all that being said, welcome Rob, welcome Noemi. Hi. Um, hello. Lovely to be here. Very nice to have you both. Um, I have this small, you know, fan moment. So I put this shirt only on special episodes. <laughs> uh, the last time I put it was with Kate Rewa, so... It is a special day today. It's a fine shirt, and, that's, <laughs> and that's, a prestigious, that's a prestigious moment to wear it. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I'd like to do is to start with some small transitions, personal transitions, and how it helped you be involved in the transition movement. It, make, it will make sense a bit better when, when I explain. Okay. So I'll, I'll make a, a short life trajectory of you both, and then please let me know um, how and why you took some decisions. So let's start with you, Rob. If I speed run your life, you studied arts, left uh, travel in Asia, a friend of yours got you into permaculture, you studied environmental quality and resource management, taught permaculture, constructed cob houses. A tra after a tragic fire, you moved to Totnes, you co-founded Transition Tau Totnes, you co-founded Transition Network, you did a PhD that not a lot of people know on localization and resilience 
at the local level, the case of Transition Town Totnes. You wrote books uh, and now are a serial, a serial social entrepreneur. And all of this might seem logical when I read them in that <laughs> order. But I guess for you, it wasn't at all logical and there was a lot of... Uh, you know, uh, fuzzy moments. Yeah, when I did that PhD, sh <laughs> shortly afterwards, Plymouth <laughs> University got in touch and they said, well, you know, we'd, we'd like to invite you to come in and talk to our students and uh, and tell them about your career path. I was like, are you <laughs> joking? No one wants to do that. It was basically sort of going from, I, I think the thing that runs through them all is, is, a, is a commitment to choosing uh, what made me really curious and what I was really passionate about rather than what was ever going to make <laughs> us any money. So there was a lot of times during that of, of living with very, very little money and bringing, bringing kids up with very, very little and living very, very simply, but with a, a, a really firm kind of a commitment that this is what we want to do and this is the direction we're going to move in. And, and uh, yeah, so it's, I guess there's always, for me, I've always been, since I was about 13, been really inspired by that kind of uh, do-it-yourself culture that mm. came out of punk, which was a big influence for me. And so I've always uh, been really motivated by, oh, well, I'm, not, I'm just going to do this. Let's try this and see what happens. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. But actually, it's always been those things that you feel really nervous about. Oh, so really? Is, should we really? Uh, often turn out to be the richest sort of fruit in terms of experience. Mm. And um, yeah, I, I guess this curiosity is the term that might define you better as both. I mean, you're still a researcher, even if you don't say. I mean, if you even if you don't present yourself as, <coughs> as a researcher, I guess this curiosity underneath is perhaps uh, the, the underlying thread, as you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I I, I feel like. Yeah, I did the PhD, which was a which was a kind of a formal piece of research through university. I don't do any other work in that regard, but I think that I'm always researching because I'm endlessly curious and endlessly hungry. It's why the, I do the podcast I do mm -hmm. because it's if I just ring up certain people and say hi, <laughs> can you speak to me? They'd be like, who are you? Yeah. If I ring them up and say hi, could you be on my podcast? Then you actually get to meet some incredible people. Mm. So I'm always reading, always looking around for ideas, always looking for new things. It's just, yeah, it's I'm 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 a curious person. <laughs> yeah, I, I it resonates when you talk about the podcast. Uh, excuse. Yeah, 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 it's a good excuse, and you could drink <laughs> Kate Rayworth. Hey, Kate, fancy yeah. going for a drink? Uh, but actually, yeah, that's what I, I owe her a, a kite surfing lesson. I have to admit so that that was my <laughs> my commitment to her. Um, Noemi, if I do the same for you, I think that. Um, so from what I gathered, you uh, studied anthropology mm -hmm. and then you were a bit disappointed from anthropology because it didn't offer you keys to actually transition stuff on the ground and change some, um, um, well, living conditions. And then you, at the same time, somehow heard, I think, climatic pieces of information and that got you a bit worried or scared. And then at the same time, you, you did a, a bunch of training certifications about non-formal education and group facilitation. And then you discovered the transition movement, if I understand correctly, in 2012 or something like that. Uh, but then you were committed to the transition network, both in Brussels and now created this transition hub over here. So was the path a clear one or also what, there is a, an underlying thread underneath all of that? Mm, thank you. Very <laughs> interesting. Um, I, I would say that um, the, the line is uh, humans and how humans adapt to uh, what stress them. Mm. Um, so so my, my starting point was more uh, humans than climate. And it was a generation where I had the feeling I had to choose between nature, environment or humans and uh, social justice. Um, so I think, yeah, understanding humans is really what... Uh, trigger me and excite me and today I really like uh, what I'm doing because I can witness uh, each day what's the, voilà, the, the, the alternative that people are building, their collective intelligence and how much uh, yeah, they are willing to, uh, to, to save their life in this uh, emergency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can imagine. Also, I think in terms of academia, that I don't think there was something back in the day, right, that enabled mm -hmm. to have social justice Mm -hmm. and climate issues or mm -hmm. environmental issues and the, the, the human, let's say, what is the human well-being and all of that. So 
I think the, these are this connection is is new to us as let's say the, the academic world, whereas in reality, you know, that's the the goal, right? Mm -hmm. How do we achieve these three pillars at the same time? Mm -hmm. So yeah. It, Sometimes I would like to go back in studies and, and find an answer to that, but <laughs> yeah. Now that we intimately know you both, <laughs> <laughs> I want to, uh, to help everyone listening to, to start off from the same foundation. So let's start with some definitions, if you mm. will. Uh, perhaps you can define what is a transition town and what is the transition movement, and if you can give us some figures or numbers or something else. Okay, so... Um so we define the transition movement as being a movement of communities who are trying, who are reimagining and rebuilding the world, and it's a model that started, as you mentioned, in in Totnes, which is the town where I still live, about 16 years ago, and uh, it's now spread to 50 countries around the world. Um, uh, thousands of initiatives it's always very hard to put an exact number on it because they come they go there's ones you don't even hear about um, but there's lots of them and there's 26 countries that have what we call a national hub like mm. the Réseau de Transition uh, Suisse Romandier but they're, they're the same in 25 other countries mm -hmm. uh, yeah so it's basically a, a kind of a it's a model for people who are concerned about the, the world and what's happening in it and the climate emergency, the ecological emergency. It's a model for the people who say, yeah, so what can we do about it here? What can we do here? We're not going to, if we don't just sit and wait for someone else, there's no cavalry, obviously, <laughs> coming riding to the rescue. What if we were the cavalry? Yeah. What could we do? So yeah. it's, a, it's like a, a self-organizing experiment. It's, a, it's like a, an enormous piece of action learning research that's taking place all over the world. In individual communities, it looks like uh, people come together, they particularly, I guess, look at food, energy, uh, local economy through a lens of quite practical, okay, what are we going to do? So it's, it's they're, they're, they start building a new economy in that place, mobilizing people, supporting each other, working together. So it's very solutions focused. Somebody once called it hope with its sleeves rolled up, which I rather <laughs> like. So it has, but it also has that, that imagination piece mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. of holding those kind of community what if spaces where people can come together and imagine what comes after this because something needs to, yeah. And when do we call a town a transition town? I, I remember one time <laughs> in France, in, 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 in Totnes, we had this group who came who were like French dignitaries from some local g council somewhere who came uh -huh. on like a fact-finding mission yeah. to Totnes and we were all sitting down and uh, they said, so uh, so this process of declaring Totnes a yeah. transition Is town. Is there a label that so, we can... Uh, yeah, so, th so they were like, so how did that work? How did you get all the permissions, all the different people on board <laughs> to call it a trans... I said, we didn't. We just very audaciously said, this is now a transition town mm -hmm. because, it's not, because it's not a statement of, of having reached a destination. It's a statement of intent. So they were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so it's 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 something that you need a handful of people in a town to come together. Mm. The, the the kind of certification is quite light touch. It's not like becoming organic or something. You know, mm. it's like you if you feel you're a transition town and you're doing transition kind of stuff, then our role is not to endlessly analyze and vet what you're doing. It's to see it's to support you and to give you tools and resources and, and to see what you need. Mm. And indeed, from the very beginning, I mean, there was some, uh, uh, well, very practical uh, tips about how to become a trend. I mean, that was the whole point, I guess. It was helping others to, to follow the path, right? Yeah, I mean, in the Transition Handbook, which is the book you have there, which was 2008, uh, you know, one of the, there was a guy called Luigi Rossi, who was a, who was a, an academic researcher mm -hmm. who, who did, who did, I think one of the best bits of research about the transition movement. He published it in a book called Everything Gardens. Mm -hmm. And he came to Totnes and he basically lived there for a year and went to everything. Every, he'd be putting out the chairs. He'd be washing up the teacups at the end of the sessions. He was amazing. And in his book, the bit that really struck me 
because you know i i mean i i'm so immersed in the movement it's not yeah. often i read a book about transition where i'm going ooh, that's an interesting <laughs> something insight new, yeah. something new his book was full of it and at one point he said the most interesting thing about transition isn't the transition movement as a kind of a a thing that academics can can put under a microscope and look at he said it's the transition moving it's the way in which mm. it over that, that time has changed and evolved and adapted so the transition handbook when it, in the bit about how to do transition, it includes what we called the, at the time we called the twelve steps of transition because mm. we, people were saying, "What are you doing?" I think I don't know. Well, we're doing a bit, <laughs> a bit of this, and then I guess we do a little bit of that, and then at the end we're kind of aiming to do a bit of that. Oh, there's twelve of them, and because in the book we were comparing our oil, like talking about yeah. oil addiction, it's quite nice. Twelve steps addiction. Blah, blah, blah. Then about three years after that book, we then went back out to all the transition groups and said, "What are you actually doing?" And they, might, they would say, well, we did step four and then step seven and then some other stuff completely and then back to realize we hadn't done step one. And nobody was going one, two, three, four, mm. five, six, seven. Mm. So, so we started then to, 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 to map out all the things they were doing and inspired by a book called A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander, which yep, I think yep. is the great work of genius of mm -hmm. the 20th century that, and the works of Captain Beefheart. And uh, we... Uh, Good songs uh, indeed. Yeah, and so we, st we, we then started to say instead, well, actually, transition is like a pattern language. It's like a larder full of ingredients, and you assemble them in your own way. And each of those ingredients is a different thing we've seen transition groups doing that works. And they kind of come in blocks because there are some you do at the beginning, some you do after that, some you do at the end, some we don't know. We're just speculating about them yet. And that was a book called The Transition Companion, which I think was never translated mm. into French, but I think was one of the best things we did. But then every book then, like The Power of Just Doing Stuff and now The, the Essential Guide to Doing Transition, they're all based on then going back to the movement, seeing what they're doing and learning from it. So it's that, it's that moving, you know, and then The Transition Network then became a holocratic organization, yeah. that shift in governance you know the work that we're doing now around really trying to uh, uh, practice good good kind of intersectional thinking and, uh, and action and and good inclusive practice all of that stuff feels like it's really part of that that same journey that and it's the way it changes that's more fascinating to me than what it is or mm. was um, just before looking at what is the operation of a of a transition town and hub um in your phd you did a critical analysis of transition toughness what are some critical elements that you saw by observing this was there some elements that you s that you understood in a different way by having another pair of glasses or was w what were the learnings and then you said did it help you to to change anything or was it more of a distanciation to to understand the phenomenon one of the things that, that that i really wanted to do with it was to i was really fascinated in this concept of resilience indicators mm. like how how would you know that your place was becoming more resilient yeah so <laughs> in a, to cut a long story short basically i read all the literature yeah where people said hmm yeah it's really difficult that <laughs> And then I tried to do it. You should my do finding more was, research to, to find that out. Yeah, yeah. my <laughs> finding was, hmm, yeah, it's really complicated. <laughs> and I suggested some things and pointed to where they were. Other people had done them. <clears throat> I think what was useful uh, was that it kind of gave me the opportunity to, to, to do some... I was, with a t as a typical permaculturist, trying to do multiple function where everything where you do one thing mm. in the aim that it's doing various functions it gave me the opportunity to do bits of research which were really useful for transition in totnes mm. at that time so i did a whole load of oral history interviews which were fascinating about what life was like in that place before there was cheap oil uh, i did a big survey which gave us some really useful data about the understanding and support for transition in the town. Uh, we did a, a piece of research called Can Totnes Feed Itself, which was a sort of mm. mapping of the land around the town and how it could be used. Mm. And so all of that stuff, I think, was really, really useful. Um, uh, yeah, the, the nice thing about it was that I think I remember my supervisor saying there's only only f most PhDs are only read by three people. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> the person who read four four people maybe if you've got two people yeah, coming exactly. in for your viva, That's and funny. actually it got yeah, downloaded, exactly. it got downloaded thousands of times and loads of people read it. So that was there are always worth exceptions. Doing. Yeah, there's always exceptions. Yeah. <laughs> um, Noemi, I'd like to to help me understand what it is to be actively involved in a transition hub. Uh, you've seen two of them. 
Uh, so you know exactly how all of this works. So how did your involvement start? And then what were you doing? And then what is it to create one hub? What, what is the process in these three years now to mm. create a, an entire new hub? Thank you. Uh, I remember, um, I don't know if it's Rob, but maybe saying that uh, transition, um, there is a place for everybody in transition movement and that everybody is very welcome to bring their skills, their competencies or their wish for creativity and finding solutions. So I, I came to the, um, the Belgian hub and I said to them, um, I'm a trainer in community work and what can I do to support you? So that was the start. And also the start was um, the, the governance. So mm -hmm. I was very interested by the shared governance and also the positive... So, so, sociocracy, holacracy and all of that? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, hol holacracy mm -hmm. and also the positive vision. I was tired of... Um, um, direct action and kind of uh, pessimistic um, and, and, and tough uh, direct action. And uh, the last thing was uh, discovering the inner transition so I could be uh, an activist and also taking care of myself, the group where I was involved and also reflecting with my uh, relationship with uh, the others than humans. So I was like, wow, that's very uh, new and interesting. So I'm involved there. Um, I think the first step is to... Um, um, connect with the, the other hubs in mm -hmm. the world and mm -hmm. ask them how they did it. So then you got loads of support and you got the support from Transition Network that yeah, tell you first um, meet... Step uh, one, then step two. But yeah, <laughs> step one, well, you find your way, but yeah, uh, yeah. the first thing is not to be alone mm. and to find um, people that are really involved in initiatives or experimentation of transition in their family, in their job, in their uh, collective. And, and then talk together and see is there already um, like um, how do you say an antenne like um, yeah uh, like a relay or something a like relay that. from yeah. a transition network is that yeah. existing or not and then you you start to see uh, um, what's there and who would like to be involved uh, with you and what's f step one I don't know to be also um, a bit uh, hmm, crazy because yeah. it, it asks a lot of uh, yeah it asks a lot of uh, uh, courage and um, and also um, you, you don't know where it will go yeah. uh, but what you know is that the demand is is, is big people are uh, calling you to make a workshop conference to ask you advices from all around the place from a lot of different topics so you realize that expertise on experience is really needed mm. so then you yeah you start to um, to share those trainings that are shared around the world, like uh, launch, how to start uh, a dynamic, or um, how to work in a group that is uh, resilient and, uh, and sustainable. And you start delivering those things, and you see that it has an impact for the groups. So it gives you energy and, um, and excitement, and also um, you can also find some fundings. Mm -hmm. And then slowly you start that enterprise, that association. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the first step. And then I think is asking for help is really important also for the local movement that is already there. We had uh, great support from a local NGO here and people that really trust in that new uh, paradigm. Paradigm? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, paradigm. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's, it's the story of uh, companionship, I think. Mm. Mm. And so it, it was you, perhaps with some other people, and just knocking on doors, looking at initiatives and documenting that and then trying to, in a permaculture way, develop links between all of them and make the, make them more than the sum of them or something like that. Yeah, yeah. someone said, oh, we should do a, a map, but then uh, <laughs> they, it already exists an international map, but uh, yeah. the Swiss map was not so active. So then we, we, we proposed to a lot of initiatives to log in into mm -hmm. that map. Then we created um, a transition day that's a place uh, where all the transition uh, people and initiatives can meet. This year is the 16th of October in Morges. Yeah. So we are hosted by Morges en Transition. And, and from there, there is also a lot of nice uh, demand uh, and also proposals. And then we, we, we jump on that and we surf on that. And then we design also what we propose to the other uh, people that are active. So slowly we are doing that. And then, of course, trainings, because trainings is... Uh, is really important to uh, for the initiatives and is uh, one of the roots of the movement. Mm. Yeah, we're going to come back to the trainings in mm -hmm. just a bit. I, I wanted also to provide some um, 
So we, we talked about the, the definition, but perhaps there are also some concepts that are core uh, within the transition movement, uh, which is well, either resilience, localization, where we need to act locally. And I guess over here, you also mentioned that this in between, pressed in between the, the peak oil on the one hand, climate change on the other. Uh, what are the, why these concepts you think were the, the, the important ones to, to, to boil down to actually a transition movement? I mean, we don't really, like in, in the transition handbook and mm. at the beginning, peak oil was definitely one of the sort of narratives at the time. We don't really f focus on that so much now because mm. I think it's clear that the, the overwhelming imperative is to leave oil in the ground, not it's, that it's, it's uh, th that, we ha that we can't wait for a peak and a gradual yeah. decline <laughs> in production. We've just got to stop using the stuff really, really fast. Mm. Um, so, but but that was, it was the, Id I guess the founding idea. I remember I went to a talk by a guy called um, Aubrey Mayer, who's a violinist and also had come up with this model that was called contraction and convergence. Okay. And the model was basically if you, you know, the, the, the global north is kind of really, really high up in terms of its consumption and it needs to come way, way, way down and the global to a line that the global south is currently beneath mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. can come up to. So yeah. it's the idea that there is a kind of an equitable, sustainable point at yeah. which uh, we need to get to and that the global north needs to make that journey down. And, and I remember sitting watching him giving this talk and thinking, okay, that's, that's only going to happen if, it f if that journey down feels like a move towards something utterly irresistible and mm. delicious and mm. irreplaceable and historic, if it feels like you are being dragged away from something irreplaceable, like a child who's had too many sweets and who you're taking home from a birthday party that they really want to stay at, it's never going to work. You know, we had that, that's the bit that we have to figure out. And it's the bit that I've seen much, much less work on. You know, a lot of the work is about the nuts and bolts and the carbon yeah. and the strategies for the cars and stuff. How do you cultivate the longing for mm -hmm. that to happen? The desire, you know, yeah. The desire, because unless we, unless we really long for it, it's never going to happen. And then that's where, that's the work of imagination and storytelling mm. and music and poetry and creativity mm. and all those things that help to bring that alive because, because otherwise it doesn't happen. So it's why, I guess, it's partly why there's a kind of a spirit that runs through the Transition Handbook and all the mm. stuff that we've done since, which is trying to bring in that element of playfulness and creativity and... Uh, you know, which sometimes people go, oh, you're very, very optimistic. It's like, <laughs> it's not so much, it's, it's, which oversimplifies it. It's more that I think just talking about collapse and, and, and extinction all the time doesn't cultivate longing that actually this should feel like the most exhilarating thing to be part of. Because mm. if we get it right, what I was trying to remind people is if we, are, if we were to actually do what the climate scientists tell us we have to do in the next 10 years, which is not net zero by 2050, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like pretty much genuine zero by 2030. If we actually did that, what an extraordinary time to have lived through when we, when we imagined and then designed and created and, and created that sort of, I would call it a revolution of the imagination, you know, where we've reimagined education, uh, uh, food, energy, transport, everything. What an incredible time to be alive. So I, th I think it's really important to 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 speak to that part of people uh, I, I was saying talks you know like if we imagine we're going to make the change we need to do with it feeling like a long walk home in the rain on a cold thursday in november <laughs> we're kidding ourselves that's not gonna yeah, this yeah. should be the best party in town and i guess that's part of the spirit and then now what i try and do with a lot of the work i do around imagination is trying to find those ways to um to, to, to try and help people to imagine what it would be like to be in that future. Yeah. So every talk I do, we do this time travel exercise where I, people imagine they're traveling through time. In the podcast that I do, we do the same thing with the, yeah. with the guests. Uh, I've, we've done kind of bits of animation, working with animators to try and bring that to life. I'm currently doing a music project working with an amazing uh, kind of ambient electronic artist where I go and record things that exist now. So mm. We call it field recordings from the future. 
So I go to a project, I record it, I speak to them if it, as if it's 2030 and this is just now how it is everywhere. What was it like when you think back to 2022 and everyone thought you were completely mad? And, and, I, and I record what it sounds like and then he builds these tracks that are this really mm. kind of immersive. So I'm always looking for those ways to help to bring it al al alive for people. But you, yeah, you hit the, the nail on the head because I mean, that's specifically what I'm doing. I'm looking for option A, option B. Uh, I'm really trying to focus on measuring stuff and then try to propose policies that are unsexy to anyone, even to myself. <laughs> and then you, no, but you propose stuff and you're like, okay, the logical stuff, if A comes in and B comes out, okay, you take out B and then re-inject it and all of that. But sure, I mean, technically that's the ideal. Politically, it's not even done. So there is something else, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and... That's why I enjoy the, the, the title of this book, that, that is, if I'm doing the what is, you're saying the what if. Yeah. And so over there, the idea is to, to help us, well, build this uh, desirable future and, and, and feel, so have like a superhero cape on us and say like, we changed things and thanks to us, the future is going to be what we want and, and feel a part of not this, well, unfortunately, this generation that has wrecked most of the things, but the generation that has repaired, the generation that, that feels also responsible for healing some of the, the, the bad things that we have done. So, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I can imagine that a lot of people tell you that it, this is a bit optimistic or sometimes a bit naive, but I don't see how we're going to be compelled to move because we're, I mean, most of us feel a bit of anxiety in terms of what do I do now? What, what is, mm -hmm. what is f f step a, what, what, mm. what can I do in my life? What I love is that usually the people who tell me that the stuff that I do is naive are people who believe that endless economic growth yeah, yeah. is possible <laughs> on a finite <laughs> on a finite planet, which always seems like the most astute, absurdly naive thing uh, I've ever heard. Really, um, yeah. I mean, it's I I know people who who are scientists who who are doing very sort of uh, you know the the, the more the less glamorous kind of side of figuring this out. But actually, it's when they often... There's some really interesting kind of collaborations now happening between uh, those kind of people and people who do illustrations for graphic novelists. Mm -hmm. There's a guy called James mm -hmm. Mackay, who's work at the University of Leeds, whose work I often show in my talks. The man who draws the future. Mm -hmm. He does graphic novels set in 2035 or something in the future. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, there are scientists who are working with musicians. Uh, there was a woman I met uh, in Arles uh, uh, last week who's an illustrator who works with um, uh, um, biologists who are, who are measuring the biodiversity in the Loire River, and she goes out with them, and then she, she brings their work to life through painting and drawing. You know, I think there's more and more of this now. Mm. Uh, scientists working with musicians to help bring their to mm. work. And there's a guy... <laughs> What one of these one of the tracks we're doing for this field recordings from the future is is that I went into a I went to visit a project called Permafungi in Brussels, uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. growing mushrooms uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in, in underground there, and just so atmospheric the sounds yeah. in that place underground is amazing. So then I put on I put out on Twitter saying, does anybody know? Because when you actually obviously when you're with mushrooms they don't do very much they don't <laughs> make they don't make any noise. So I was like put out a thing. Has anybody got any recordings of mushrooms? And there's this whole world of people making recordings putting of mushrooms mm -hmm. putting electrodes yeah. in mushrooms and recording putting it through synthesizers and this crazy yeah. kind of mushroom music you know it's like all of that stuff to help really make science accessible uh, and, and interesting for us as well because we're bored as well as academics <laughs> no but it's true I mean the reality is that we want to be part of the, the, the change we want to be part of the future as well and I think the discussion is okay what are our needs what do we really need to to live, to 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 thrive, and all of that? And okay, we need to to reduce all of our emissions, but to do what? And it's that what that is not frequently asked. Like, what makes us happy? What makes us live? What makes us 
mean, well, lead meaningful lives. I mean, one of the things that happened quite early on in, in transition was from very early, we were getting loads of academics mm. getting in touch. Hi, I want to do research on transition. I want to mm. research this. I want to research that. Here's my questionnaire. Could you distribute this to all the transition <laughs> groups in the country? And bore them to death. Bore them to death and uh, take up all of that really precious time that they already don't yeah. have to do the work that they're doing mm. that you want to measure. And um, <coughs> it became quite clear that there was that for a lot of academia then there was a, this very kind of extractive mindset. Mm. You know, I want to do some research so I can produce a paper. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they, they, they would come, they would take up loads of your time, you fill out all their questionnaires. Two years later, you'd get this piece of research that was completely incomprehensible. I mean, I've, I've, I've been asked to read <laughs> academic papers on transition. I invented this bloody yeah. thing. I can't understand a word they're talking about. I don't know what, they're, what it means. Uh, so we created this thing called the Transition Research Guide, which was a, uh -huh. which was a thing for a kind of a set of instructions for academics who want to work alongside transition. Make sure what you're going to do is going to be useful to them. Yeah. How is what you're doing actually going to help them advance what they're doing? Mm -hmm. In the ideal world, <coughs> you, 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 like Luigi Russi did, you get alongside them, mm -hmm. you join in, mm -hmm. you participate, mm -hmm. you, 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 you work with them in advance about what would be useful as, as, as research. You give them, you produce some research that will open doors for them, that might make funding more possible, that would help improve a case for them to the local government so it needs to be I don't, if I say research needs to be in service to transition that makes it sound a bit like mm. it shouldn't be critical of it which of course it should be but it needs to it needs to kind of get alongside it and get its hands dirty a yeah, bit yeah. rather rather than just swooping in from an ivory tower and just extracting and flying off again yeah mm. I, I feel what you <laughs> what you say um so we we talked I think one of the big roles you mentioned in Noemi before was is also about the the training Mm. And so we need to change mindsets and we need to also have different theoretical tools and also practices in order to, to grasp this concept and to apply some of its principles. So you have trained in different forms of training <laughs> or how to give workshops and how to give um, these type of uh, uh, tools to, to people and to organizations. So how can we help people and organizations? What, what are some steps that you help them or take them by the hand and, and what do you do with them to, to accompany them in this transition movement? Mm. Um, I think the first thing is uh, to, to, to be gentle with ourselves and to, yeah, to, to accept that we can relearn things, that we can uh, relearn the way we, we live or, or also believe in what makes us happy. So the training is also about uh, what are our, um, yeah, um, how can I say, uh, point of view and, and, and what was given to us, what was the culture we were raising mm, mm. and how can we decolonize ourselves and it's not easy and let's talk about the fact that it's not easy, what means decreasing in our group, in our family. Uh, what's also the feeling we have linked to that. So the trainings we propose is a mixture of uh, what we call uh, yeah, head, uh, mm. but we, we, are, yeah, we are not giving so much space to head in yeah, research and um, academic in the moment. And then also the hands, what can we do? And then the heart, uh, yeah, the emotions, the feelings, that, that, that beautiful energy that usually in our society and uh, in the movement is seen like uh, uh, like, yeah, something not so important or like that's something that is private or like mm -hmm, individual. Mm -hmm. So we work a lot about uh, linking all of that. And it's the same for imagination taking power. What I see in those trainings is really like to, to say to people, listen, uh, let's take us seriously. We have that power. And of course, the power around us do doesn't take those intelligence seriously. But what you feel and what you develop is very powerful. So that's, that's really uh, often what uh, amazes me when I do trainings with few people or big groups is that people are really touched by the fact that they are allowed mm -hmm. to dream big. They are allowed to make experience. They are allowed to ask for more. And yeah, so that's, that's what I like in doing trainings. Well, what's interesting is that we, we all want to be kids again and we all want to use mm. our, our muscle uh, of imaginations, but we are also very shy afraid we mm. we haven't been told to to use it anymore as well mm. so i was hearing um there was a podcast yesterday about cyril dion who did this um, movie demain mm. um, and the transition movement was one of the big pieces uh, of the movie and he was mentioning 
how films should also be part of this transition about showing within movies what the future would be like. For instance, mm -hmm. that the protagonist is with uh, with a div different uh, gender um, direction for a different for a place without cars for instance what would it be without saying that this is a decarbonized future that we want but just mm. in the background have something that is that we feed it each other from from the ground or you know in a city or not having cars within a city in the background not seeing not hearing any more cars i think we're lacking these just images in our in our mm. heads and, and I think that's how you start even in this book is, uh, and apparently these are existing examples. You, you just made a, a collage of different examples, right? Yeah, that's right. It is a kind of six page sort of walkthrough of what the future could be like. And actually as a promotional thing for the book, we made a little video people. If you put you Rob Hopkins 2030 on YouTube, there's a video of me kind of walking through the world saying, and here's this and here's that. And basically it's just photos I've taken in different places. Yeah. Uh, that we did with a with with a green screen. I I feel like, you know, that there was I think that William Gibson said something like the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed, uh -huh. and so it's like all the different stuff that we need already exists somewhere. Uh, we just need to sort of piece it together and and, and share those stories. Um, but it's that I, I mean I, I was with Cyril uh, last week in, uh -huh. in Al. He was at the night I interviewed him for an episode oh, of the, the podcast that I do, and we were talking <laughs> about this, and. Um, yeah, the stories that we see are so, so, so important. He told me a story I'd not heard before, actually, which was about how after the war, when the Marshall Plan yeah. was in place and the US were, were uh, you know, giving billions of dollars to Europe to rebuild itself, there was a particular guy, and I don't remember his name, whose job was, uh, but, but he, he was part of negotiating that. But part of the deal was that France would, that 60% of films shown in cinemas had to be American films because it meant that they then had control of those narratives around <laughs> consumer culture and glitzy, you need a car and this, that and the other that then they could be, then they could be supplying. And it's always that a really interesting question for me, you know, where are the stories, yeah. the, the stories that people are telling now? Because so much of what you see, I, I, we, I was on holiday a couple of weeks ago with my family in Brittany, Brittany and I spent a very depressing 20 minutes in a bar watching, they had the TV on mm. showing rap videos. Oh my God, it's all like the big cars and the, and the clothes and the everything, like this total, the, the bling, yeah. the gold, the <laughs> diamonds, the everything. <coughs> it's like, oh no, you know, this reinforcing, reinforcing. All the, even when you watch the football, the adverts around the side of fossil fuels and holiday yeah. companies. You know, and Coke and, and stuff Coke like that. And Coke and all the, the crap, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that idea that we should just be, every time you turn on to watch an exciting detective drama mm -hmm. or a nice sort of romantic program or something, they should be walking through streets in a city full of nut trees and vegetable gardens. And, you know, it's like, the, so the, the best example I can always think of where people say, but where's a film that already exists is Wallace and Gromit and the Curse of the Were-Rabbit. If you know that film, no, it's one of the know. Wallace and Gromit. It's like an English animation mm -hmm. done with like mm -hmm. plasticine people, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, and it's ah, set yeah, in yeah. this. It's set in this. Li it's set in this village where all the houses are kind of terraced houses, and everyone's growing vegetables and trying to grow bigger <laughs> carrots than each other. And there's not very many cars, and everyone rides bicycles. And that, but that, it, but that's not the story. But that's just the exactly. world going on in the background. Mm. And we need, we need. And I, I did a, I did a present recently at a, at a conference organized by Ubisoft in Paris okay. who are one of the biggest computer games company I did have to tell them at the beginning of the conference that the last time I played any computer game with any degree of dedication was Pac-Man which rather <laughs> sort of made me fairly <laughs> useless to the conference but we were talking you know I, I like there, there's a game called Assassin's Creed yeah. uh, where it's like this assassin runs around in the city and they did a thing a few years ago where they create they worked with historians to create the most accurate version of what they thought ancient Egypt would have been like mm. you're running through the markets you're running through the fields and it's an amazing thing I was saying we should you should be doing that with 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 this low carbon future and do it with places that people know mm. have a game set in a, 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 a localized decarbonized Paris and kill people around and if you want to kill people, <laughs> but maybe maybe the game is designed in such a way where after killing a couple of people you have it you're racked with conscience and you think my god I can't I do this anymore I have quick, to grow yeah. things to purge my soul I need to I need to become a 
I need to become a craft brewer in an abandoned car park beneath Brussels. And the course offers you like training in different things. I don't know, anyway. So, <laughs> but it's, it's like that's, that's we, it, we need to make this stuff normal. Yeah. That's the thing. And, 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 and the, the cultural flows and the cultural narratives the other direction are so powerful. We're up against massive PR companies, like marketing companies who know our psychology better than we do. Yeah. And, uh, and now with the, with the internet makes them 10 times more powerful than they were before they can try and, you know, sell you things while you're in the bath. You know, it's like... <laughs> because it's, you pronounce the soap and... Uh, <laughs> because you, you, your phone heard you drop in a soap. You need more yeah. soap? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's quite terrifying. So, mm-hmm. so The connected soap. The connected Bluetooth, soap. Bluetooth, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Smart soap. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, indeed, I, I'm looking forward to the f- to the movies of uh, of Cyril. I'm wondering as well. There are some times of imagination. Um, you at the end of your book, you you talk about '68, the year '68, about May '68 in France, about Prague '68, about California '68, about you know so many countries in the world that there was actual change that happened, mm. right? I mean, in Paris, it was nice and wonderful and some creative movements and they even uh, one of the things was uh, giving power to imagination and being realistic asking the impossible yeah. and all demanding that. the impossible demanding the impossible mm. uh, so paris was the cute one let's say because there wasn't deaths involved uh, in other places there were actual I deaths think there were one or two but then, sure 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 and they had cooler sunglasses in paris and they had nice and, well i mean it's funny because my my mom lived through paris 68 and prague okay. 68 and i called her uh, yesterday to to ask her what how was it mm. like what was this feeling of living in 68 and it, it's it's funny because it was a mix between chaos like you yeah. didn't know what things were happening and where there was new slogans every day there was new political directions every day everything was in uh, can you say boiling or evolution? Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. boiling. And at the same time, you felt that, well, they were hearing demands and they were, you know, doing stuff accordingly. Unfortunately, well, in France and many other places, when the demands or some of them were met, the movement kind of died off. So I'm wondering, how do we reenact or redevelop this year 68? What do we do in order to? Is it already there? Did we in 2020 live this during the pandemic or the year before with, you know, the the climate strikes? Or do we win, do do we need to somehow make this once again like 2022 be the new 68? Hmm. So who wants to? Uh, I, I I feel like I'm living in that time, mm-hmm. um, especially when I read the feminist. Um, magazine and also decolonizing the movement decolonial Mm -hmm. and when I see all those people in the street and the young people like I I can witness a culture that surprised me and and that really um, I'm I'm very excited and proud to to be alive in this time so yeah for me it's really um, a revolution when I see that I was I was born in the 80s and the, the time of my parents and now I'm like wow it's so cool mm. so I can wait to be in 20 years and see what the stories will be about us mm, yeah I mean I, 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 I feel very similar that, that actually I think it's it's very easy to have a lot of hindsight and kind of uh, uh, um, revisionism about mm. 68 uh, but for me I, I I kind of grew up I guess in a sort of my earliest politics was kind of anarchist politics and and I read so many books about May 68. (laughs) It was always a real source of inspiration. I feel like the way I understand what happened in in, in 68 was that the students came out Mm -hmm. and what they were trying to do was to get the workers to come out and and that actually that that didn't quite happen on the scale that they wanted it to happen. So I feel like actually at the moment we are we're kind of in that bit between You know, we're in the bit where we now have a massive climate movement around the world. Mm -hmm. Extinction Rebellion, Fridays Mm -hmm. for Future. Mm -hmm. My God, Fridays for Future. Mm. Uh, Incredible. It's kind of, it's faded a bit now, which I think is really also really dangerous because those first Fridays for Future were so exhilarating. I took my kids on three of them. They made me cry every time. Mm. Phenomenal. The wit and the humor and the passion and the... Mm. 
and the smartness of those of mm. those exactly. kids, yeah. the mm. guts of those kids, and the mm. way they learned as well. I remember the first one; it was all a bit chaotic and shambolic. By the third one, they had it they down. And those people yeah. who were saying they should be in school learning stuff, I'm like, are you joking? Yeah. Do you know how <laughs> much learn they're what? learning being yeah. on this thing? <laughs> they're learning how to work together, how to speak, to how to work with the police, how mm. to they, uh, they're learning how to argue, to make their arguments. It was phenomenal. So we've had the Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion. Just stop oil now. Mm-hmm. Insulate Britain. What's it? Whatever it's called. Renovate Swiss or something. Whatever mm-hmm. it's called. Renovate here. Switzerland. Switzerland. Yeah. You know. So there's all these different movements at the same time. You've also had you know Black Lives Matter, mm-hmm. massive. Yeah. Uh, but what it hasn't done. Me too. Is uh, me too. Mm-hmm. Uh, what we have. What they haven't done. And and then also in the UK this. Uh, the the, the 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 women's movement that, that emerged after Sarah Everard was killed by a serving member of the Metropolitan Police and how the police dealt with that. So there's a whole generation of young people who are who have had it with the police, particularly yeah. in London and the way the police have behaved. But what hasn't happened is is the, is the workers and the working class coming out in support and co- working together. We're going to see that this winter. I mm-hmm. think. There's yeah. a movement called Enough is Enough, which mm-hmm. is starting in the UK, which is a really inspiring coming together of trades unions, uh, church groups. Uh, uh, we're, I think we'll, we'll be seeing a general strike mm. in the UK this winter. It's going to be awful. 25% of families in the UK won't be able to afford to heat their homes we're gonna, we're gonna, it's gonna create a, a legacy of intergenerational ill health going yeah. forward. It's awful, and uh, and and so I think that maybe, th- maybe this is where we get really? to the the nineteen sixty eight mm-hmm. point. But hopefully, it will be able to achieve what nineteen sixty eight failed to do. Yeah, because it'll be able to mobilize the working classes because people have just had enough of it at this point. It's awful. Yeah. And also another example. Yesterday we were um, meeting a, a young guy who, who is developing a brewery, mm-hmm. and we were asking him, uh, "So d- can you live uh, like s- live uh, your life with that?" And he mm-hmm. said, "I'm I'm earning 1,000 francs per month. I have a vegetable garden, and um, I'm I'm learning to live with poverty and to explore that concept." Uh, I have a good family that support me, so I'm not scared. And then I ask him, but what do you think for all those people that are trying those experiences to reply to um, climate emergency, what will happen? And we will discover, uh, discovering that we will also be pissed off mm. and that we will join those movements like Gilets Jaunes in France mm. and that yeah, we will be part of that because today it's uh, one of the priorities that we can move from volunteer work and also tiredness from uh, holding that on our shoulders uh, like activists and yeah we will we will also develop strategy to be heard like like the others uh, friends of us XR are proposing or uh, renovate Switzerland and so on so let's see what the initiatives will will do and what will be created yeah yeah I, th- I think as well like one of the things I cause when I was in France recently and in fact, from talking to Cyril, was this idea that a lot of p- that people talk about the sort of the, the generation demain mm. in France, mm-hmm. you know, that generation mm. of kids who were yeah. 16, 17, 18, when they saw that film. And, and, and I met, because I was in Paris when it was first released, and I went to five or six screenings there, because ah, nice. I was speaking at them, you know. And it was like, every audience was at least half young people. Yeah. And they would come up at the end t- to talk to me afterwards, and they would be saying, we love this so much. And I would say, well, why? Why, why, do, why do you like it so much? And they, this was shortly after the Bataclan attacks yes. in mm. Paris. Yes. And they said, because this is our story. Yeah. After those attacks, we were like, well, what's our story? We're like, what's France for? What yeah. are we doing? What's, what's this all about? My and now we have yeah. our story. This is our identity. And now yeah. those that generation have gone through university, have gone mm. through whatever they're doing, and they're kind of coming out into the world. And this is this is their North Star. You know, this is what their expectation of what they want to be creating is, you know. And uh, and I th- it's really interesting to see the different directions that goes into. Yeah, it's it's quite overwhelming teaching uh, right now because you have well students that were born in two thousands more or less, and uh, mm. and they're overwhelmingly more active than you, and <laughs> you're trying to keep up with yeah. with what their ideas, mm. their innovation, their imagination, mm. their their passion, and and you're just trying to keep up and. And you feel guilty that you're not able to provide as much as as they're doing. So I I hope that this, well, form of guilt will also be liberating to actually act and and be, well, feel that you need to 
to be part of this movement. Else, you, you're going to be on the you know on the bad side of history somehow if, if you don't act. And they're so smart. Yeah. Like mm. I I um uh, I had we did a, an episode of my podcast about what if young people reimagined the education system, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and we had uh, a young there were two eighteen year old people, a young Muslim girl from Birmingham called Yumna, and uh, a non binary young person from London. Oh my God! Me and Ben, who were presenting it, were like. God, when I was 18, I could <laughs> yeah, exactly. barely string a exactly. sentence together, you know, yeah. and they're so <laughs> articulate on yeah. gender and mm-hmm. race and mm-hmm. I, just amazing. And, f- you know, for me in this work that I do about imagination, actually, the the place where I get the most inspiration around all of this work mm. at the moment is young black women writers in America, mm. uh, uh, Adrienne Marie Brown, uh, uh, Walida Imarisha, uh, Mariam Kaba, all these, pe- you know, people... Who, whose work on imagination is just phenomenal. The prison abolition movement, yeah. the border abolition movement, mm. these movements that mm. are the, the massive, massive what if questions. What if there were no prisons? Now there's a question. <laughs> yeah. That's so, so exciting and incredible. Because then you're just like, well, what does that mean for education? What does that mean for policy? What does that mean for housing? What does that mean for, well, for justice? For justice. Yeah. What does that mean for how we process and manage trauma in, mm. in our society and, and name trauma and work with trauma? And mm. it's so much more uh, incredible. So there are some phenomenal people out there. Yeah. Okay, now that you said that, okay, let's go back to the task of today. Oh, did we have a task? Yes. <laughs> so we have to imagine a world where all cities, mm-hmm. towns, and villages have internalized and applied the principles of the transition movement. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you will now need to guide us through this word and describe it a bit and tell us what it feels like. Mm. Who wants to go first? People are telling beautiful stories about uh, today and, and the past and how much it's a pleasure to, uh, to share the street, to share uh, the, the job also they are doing. So they are really beautiful stories. Yeah, I, th- I think one of the, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll, play, we'll play vision tennis. We can go, <laughs> ah, go ahead, go ahead, Rob. <laughs> we, I'm, can, I'm we can take it in turns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would yeah. be nice. I, th- I think one of the things that has really happened is that the the relationship between cities and the rural areas has been reimagined. Mm. So the connection that defined them a hundred years ago has been reestablished. So the land around cities is is largely dedicated to, to to supplying those cities, and it's meant that there has been a process whereby cities have ca- have have allowed themselves to breathe a little bit so it meant that in order for that new system of a much much more diversified landscape around our cities a mixture of rewilding um, a mixture of um, uh, a much more diversified landscapes we no longer just see these massive fields growing one single thing there's 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 agroforestry integrated into it there's uh, th- it's, it's a form of agriculture that needs more people because mm-hmm. farm size has, has got smaller again. So it means that more people are living in the countryside. So when you spend time in, in rural areas, you hear more people. You hear more diversity, you hear more insects, you hear more birds, you also hear more people, you hear, you hear the, co- the communities that are there. Um, and and that, that movement of people into rural areas uh, has really revitalized those spaces, but it's also meant that cities were able to open up some spaces within themselves, uh, particularly in kind of poorer neighborhoods, to bring that that wildness and diversity back into the cities, back into those spaces. So, so our cities now feel like the air is cleaner, they've got more space to breathe, uh, um, <laughs> Sorry, okay. What's the magazine sans transition? Thing, what was there an article that, that talks about this? On this, okay, okay. I want to read this one. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So uh, you know, this is some of these uh, some of these issues are explored in an issue of Sans Transition magazine <laughs> called the Nature in the City. Uh, nature in the City. 
la nature en ville. Le précédent épisode était appelé « Relation ville-nature ». So yeah. might, But, we might find some common now. Because that, that relationship yeah. is so broken down at the moment. Mm. Um, and I think as well, one of the things with the, the, the rewilding side of it mm. I, um, I, has been the, like the reintroduction of, of beavers into a lot of the landscape mm -hmm, mm -hmm. has meant that it's reintroduced... Ecological uh, engineers. Uh, hey? Yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> has reintroduced uh, uh, kind of magical landscapes. You know, so we now really are starting to fall in love with the seeing that process of rewilding happening and see the world restoring mm. itself. Any more bits? Yeah, yeah. For me, it's also the inner nature, like mm. to to trust in our intuition and to trust in that, uh, yeah, that intelligence we have in relationship with the other than humans and the elements, and to trust it uh, like a motor to uh, to positive change. Mm. Really, I see a lot of people are ashamed or or they um, they excuse themselves because. Uh, Yeah, they, they feel things or they feel that they are threats, as you said at the start. Mm. And in this future, people are really proud of that. And, and it's uh, common. It's not marginalized anymore. Yeah. I think as well, you know, one of the big changes that we've seen in the cities is, has, been the, has been the disappearance of the car, which was mm. something that really gained pace during COVID mm. and then just accelerated. So, you know, Berlin has now closed all the centers of the cities to cars and it's more and more stuff. Paris is now, you know, if you came to Paris in the yeah, early 2000s, thought, yeah. if you saw a cyclist, you wanted to sort of take them home and yeah. wrap them in cotton wool. Now you do, now there's just so many of them, it's amazing. And, you know, by 2030, 2035, I think cars will be quite rare in cities. And, 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 and what that has done is it's freed up an enormous amount of space. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's been a huge... You know, one of the most uh, lucrative uh, uh, livelihoods, businesses that people have created is the taking up and getting rid of tarmac mm. and the replacing of it with kind of <laughs> ed ed growing, absorbent, sort of forested landscapes. Many streets in our cities now feel more like a forest than a street. In fact, our cities, our cities become... Uh, there are so many trees now in our cities that and there are parts of the city where it feels more like a forest with some buildings in mm. and the dawn chorus in our cities is now extraordinary and uh, mental health has has improved mm. hugely because one of the other things that we did was we started to realize that it didn't make any sense to have a mental health strategy and a housing strategy and a biodiversity strategy and a job creation strategy and a healthy eating strategy that they were all the same strategy that actually you don't get mental health in isolation. Mm. You get it because people's housing is shit and they're terrified of losing mm. their housing and that they're really stressed and they're anxious because their work is terrible and they're all everything is so precarious. And so we, we realized that we needed to, to address all of this stuff together. Yeah. It's the it's the the thing that the main thing you notice when you walk around mm. is that people walk slower, mm. they look at each other much more. Mm. And and there's and people that kind of uh, almost sort of hysterical urgency that people mm. had in 2022, you don't really see very often now. Yeah. And also the people have time, uh, not only for work, mm. but to grow food, to share food, to uh, as Rob said, reskilling themselves. And really, like, um, not to put that on Sunday afternoon between uh, two laundry, but that really they have support. Mm. I don't know how maybe um, they receive, uh, like, a fund to really invest time in transition. That's really uh, very nice, and, and people are relaxed and happy to do that. Yeah. Like Satish Kumar, he said, you should work only four hours per day, not more. Yeah. And so you have the time to... Yeah, to also uh, find depend. Then you can also rethink the work, and maybe that's part of your work. It's not mm. two different things. That's yeah, that's what happened. And just the last thing I would say is, is I, I feel like it's a world that has really learned during that time to 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 celebrate and be really delighted about its diversity. Mm. So it's a it's a future th that. I think you know one of the one of the big shifts that happened was that as the you know there were in twenty twenty in twenty twenty two there were the floods in Pakistan, thirty mm. million people displaced, and and it led to a real um, 
kind of a soul searching in the global north about you know up until that point there had been this really growing narrative particularly from the right that was saying we have to close our borders close our borders that the, the kind of border industrial complex was massive and brutalizing and violent and terrible mm. and and, it, and there was a lot of soul searching about the morality of closing your borders uh, and that for the, the nations who are responsible for the vast majority of historical carbon emissions to close their borders to a country that's responsible for just one percent of carbon emissions in its whole history uh, was just seen as uh, that it just couldn't be supported on any kind of scale so there was a lot of then thinking about okay rather than just saying we're going to close our borders and that the uh, and given that the the climate emergency is going to be happening everywhere and we run a very real risk of having climate refugees from Spain within the next 10 years. Mm. Australia, where mm. are they going to, you know, so so there was a, a, a much more thinking about a, a different approach to that. So whether it was, you know, working with the, the with people of different genders, different wherever, the, the whole a, approach around seeing diversity as something to be celebrated rather than something to be feared and kind of legislated out of existence it was a big shift that happened as well yeah i mean uh I, I we could do this for hours you yeah know. right <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, i've been thinking this for days what about this. you what, what about you what do you see <laughs> so i'd like to sleep at night and be tired and sleep like a rock mm. every night mm. because you've done something that well is needed right mm. you need to To dig a hole, you need to make put tomato plants. You need to build a street for the community. You need to go and educate the, the community if you are an educator. Um, and also, all of your senses are all heightened. So you smell, and you smell a lot of different nuances. When you eat something, you this tomato is plenty plenty of taste. You know, it's not mm. just this bland tomato plenty of water and all of this. And this brings me back to when I was a kid in Greece, right? I mean, you eat vegetables and you're happy to eat vegetables. It's not, you know, this thing that you eat uh, and, and nobody knows how to cook them. Everybody knows how to cook beautiful meals. And this is the moment of the day that everybody comes together. And then after that, we, it's, well, unfortunately, it's still too hot because even if we stop all of this mess, it's still going to be hot. So mm. we're all going to sleep for an hour or two. Uh, I, I have some experience in, in that. <laughs> and then, yeah, probably we, we go out during the, 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 the night at seven or eight when it has cooled down a bit at the, the square. Mm. There are some trees. So we, we are under the trees and it's fresh. And we talk about, okay, what, what have you done today? And wh what do you think we should do uh, tomorrow? And also start to plan all together about the future of our smaller place somehow. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I hope, I, I don't know. I, I really want to feel more things in, in life and, yeah. and sense or have my senses be used and not just be tired of responding to emails and, mm. and be stressed. I, I don't... I don't think I need that no. <laughs> in my life. I don't know that anybody needs that, but yeah, working four hours per day seems like a, a good way to go. Yeah. Um, okay, let's finish with a message eventually. What message would you would like to, to give to the people that hmm. listen and watch us? Who? Go ahead. Well, I think, I think in, this, in this age of such... Uh, shortened and damaged attention spans I'd congratulate them for getting this far <laughs> yes uh, uh, I think that's kind of quite an achievement that they didn't think oh I'll just look at YouTube for a few minutes and get sucked into something else very impressive <laughs> a rabbit hole yeah. a rabbit hole of nonsense they managed to actually stay with us so thank you mm. um, I guess I would um, my message would be that would be that wherever you are, whatever organization you're working in or part of, it feels really important that you bring whatever pressure you can to get that organization to declare a climate and ecological emergency. You know, we, like the first demand of Extinction Rebellion was always tell the truth. You know, we need every organization to be telling the truth and then to be acting accordingly. So, but the acting accordingly bit, I, you know, I'm a great believer that that means that 
the imagination needs space. And at the moment, like you said, you know, we're all so busy. You know, there's always more emails. There's always more to do. There's always another deadline. There's always, and then even if there isn't, there's always like social media platforms that will mm. quite happily just devour your time for hours scrolling through nonsense. And uh, um, we need to take some space back with the people around us to create these kind of like what if spaces to come together and to do some imagining about what we're going to do. Even in our own lives, you know, m m make a Sunday where you put your phone and your computer mm. in a drawer and they mm. stay there mm. and you go for a walk and you swim in the lake and you look at the trees and you, you walk under the trees and you look up at the trees. You do some drawing, you do some poetry. You know, we, we need to give that part of ourselves uh, some space. It's wh one of the reasons I wrote that book was I had this, sort of, you know, I'm a Sylvia Plath, wrote something beautiful about what I feel, what I fear most is the death of the imagination. Mm. You know, that, that, that somewhere just out of our eye shot, this most precious of things, like unspeakably precious thing, which is, which is the source of all the great things that humanity has ever created. It's what distinguishes us as a species in sapiens, uh, he mm -hmm. talks about, you know, it, we are a storytelling creature. Mm. That's what distinguishes humanity from, from other creatures. We tell stories. But somehow we've allowed this society, this set of conditions to come together, which are mean that this imagination is kind of desiccating and blowing away in the wind. And we need to put it back in the middle in our own lives as well. What, what happens to a society that loses its imagination? It's just, it's kind of too, yeah. it's too, it's, that's what happens. It's, yeah, it's, it's, too ter it's too terrifying for words. Yeah. So we have to put it, we have in our own lives to say, mm. okay, I need to, it's like if you went to the doctor, you got a vitamin D sufficiency. Oh, I'll take some vitamin D then. We have a massive imagination deficiency. So we need to intentionally take the supplements to try and boost our imagination levels back up again. But the beautiful thing about it is the imagination is what happens when we are in balance, when we are healthy, when we're in good mental health, when we're surrounded by other people. It's, it's a kind of a manifestation mm -hmm. of the rest of us being in balance. Mm -hmm. And it feels great every talk we do we start getting the audience to do something imaginative the room fills with laughter bright eyes people connecting with each other that's why it's so so important so make some space in your life for it take mm. your imagination supplements every night and every morning every night every morning Amy, what do you think um my message will be to um to to celebrate what you are already doing mm. <coughs> and what is uh, happen happening uh, all around you Um, as I see a lot of people, I think it's not, it's not enough, it's not enough, it's not enough. And um, I realize that the more I celebrate what's going on and I see the beauty and I see also the, the power of life uh, around me, um, yeah, that's like uh, exponential. Like the more I, I put the lens of permaculture, of transition, of what if, the more it comes to me and the more I'm powerful to uh, yeah, go through this mess. Uh, so, yeah, that would be my advice to celebrate. Yeah, that's for me. Okay, any books, videos, <laughs> articles, piece of music, Ooh. something that you would like to recommend before we finish mm. up? Mm. La Belle Verte? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have a book? <laughs> of that woman? <laughs> What is the book? Economy à nous, Eva Sadoun. I think, I mean, I mentioned it earlier, but I think if people haven't read A Pattern Language by Christopher uh -huh. Alexander. And Captain Beefheart. And listen to Captain Beefheart. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and also a book called Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. Uh -huh. And uh, we do this till we free us, which is Mariam Kaba's book about uh, prison abolition, which is one of the best books I've read for a long, long time. And everybody should listen to Be My Baby by the Ronettes <laughs> at least once a week. <laughs> It should be on prescription. Aside uh, from the it's imagination the most beautiful pills, uh, because, supplements. Well, because we talked about longing <laughs> earlier. For me, it's, it, is the, it is the record with the most longing. It is, it's just the, it's like it's the longing in that record is just heartbreakingly <laughs> beautiful. So, yeah, listen to that. 
Oh. Um, yeah, I would say, I have, um, I'm reading lots of feminist books in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> one I really love is Accor et Acri. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know the, the author anymore, but uh, it's very inspiring for uh, also, um, yeah, defending your rights. And I'm reading um, Virginia Woolf, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Chambre à Soi, and I'm learning a lot about the systemic domination. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I have to say that those books really help me to also uh, interrogate uh, the movement uh, in mm -hmm. transition and to see how, in our team, what are we doing, how it is, how we... Um, replic replicating, no, replicating. <laughs> replicating also those those domination and so on. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's really I, I can read to you more titles, mm -hmm. but um, I'm really into that. And for music, uh, mm, I don't know, I, I, mm, I'm ashamed, <laughs> but I, I love the the last um, album of Tromai. Yeah, it's it's very beautiful, and um, it talks about a very important thing. So yeah, Brussels uh, at heart. Yes, it's great. <laughs> Yeah. Well, many thanks. Th thanks so much for this wonderful thank you. Uh, discussion. Thank you. Rob thank you. Beautifully Merci hosted. Beaucoup. Thank you. And thank you all for listening until the end because you've made it uh, to the end. Uh, <laughs> once again, if you like this episode and all of this discussion, just mm. share it around with friends, colleagues, uh, your family, and tell us how you envision uh, where. Uh, a world where all territories have applied the transition movement principles. Perhaps we can get inspired by all of your comments. And also don't forget, please contribute to the Swiss uh, Transition Hub crowdfunding campaign. Thanks everyone and see you in two weeks for another conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon.